for it TV. The world is thinking. Good evening. May I ask everyone to uh, to take a seat? I'm Bill Kelly. I'm the president of the CUNY Graduate Center, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this evening's Great Issues Forum. The Graduate Center, I think most of you by now know, is the doctorate granting wing of the City University of New York. We are home to 31 academic programs and 29 research centers and institutes. And as part of our public mission, we also have embarked on a very ambitious series of, of free public programs. And the highlight of that series, the marquee event, is the Great Issues Forum. Each year, the series explores a critical issue through a single thematic lens. Our current focus, the focus of this year, is power. In a series of conversations, some of you have been at, at many of them, featuring artists, intellectuals, and policymakers, as well as through our academic seminar, website, and blog, the Great Issues Forum examines the ways in which various forms of power function in the world. This is the fourth fora in the series. In our first conversation, Mary Robinson, Zbigniew Brzezinski, and Nicholas Kristof considered the subject of political power, its limits, its capacities, its responsibilities. In Great Issues 2, Nobel Prize winning economist Joseph Stiglitz, distinguished journalist Naomi Klein, and Hernando de Soto, the president of the Institute for Liberty and Democracy, discussed economic power, its exercise, and its vulnerabilities in globalized circumstance. At our most recent forum, Nobel Prize winning poet Derek Walcott joined Pulitzer Prize winning uh, dramatist Tom Stoppard in conversation about cultural power, the role of art in bridging political, ideological, religious, and geographic distance. Our final Great Issues conversation, which is scheduled for April 28th, will focus on the power of education and will bring together scholars and educators from around the world to talk about the impact of public higher education on social mobilization and economic development in the 21st century. This evening's subject is military power. Our discussion will be moderated by Tom Weiss. Tom is the Presidential Professor of Political Science at the Graduate Center and Director of the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies. He is President of the International Studies Association and Chair of the Academic Council of the UN System. Professor Weiss was awarded the Grand Prix Humanitaire de France in 2006. He has written or edited some 35 books and numerous scholarly articles about multilateral approaches to international peace and security. Professor Weiss is joined this evening by three very distinguished panelists. Alex DeWall is a writer and activist on African issues, as most of you will know. He is a fellow of the Global Equity Initiative at Harvard University, the director of the Social Science Research Council program on AIDS and social transformation, and the director of Justice Africa in London. A graduate of Oxford with a DPhil in social anthropology, he has dedicated his career to studying the effects of famine, war, genocide, and the HIV AIDS epidemic in Africa. He has been instrumental in mobilizing responses to these problems. In 2005, he joined the African Union mediation team for the Darfur conflict and is still closely involved in the search for a lasting solution to that tragic situation. His books include Famine That Kills, Darfur Sudan, AIDS in Power, Why There Is No Political Crisis Yet, and Darfur, A Short History of a Long War. General Barry McCaffrey served in the United States military for 32 years and retired as a four-star general. At the time of his retirement, he was the most decorated serving general in the military. During his 13 years overseas, McCaffrey served four combat tours of duty. From 92 to 94, he served as Lieutenant General on the Joint Chiefs Pentagon staff and was Special Assistant to Colin Powell. He commanded 26,000 soldiers during Desert Storm. He twice won the Distinguished Service Cross and the Silver Star for Valor. Following his military career, General McCaffrey was appointed by a unanimous Senate vote, director of the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy in the Clinton administration. He's currently president of his own consulting firm based in Arlington, Virginia. Thomas Ricks is the Washington Post special military correspondent where he has covered the US military since 2000. Till the end of 1999, he worked the same beat at the Wall Street Journal where he was a reporter for 17 years. 
He is a senior fellow at the Center for New American Security and a contributing editor at Foreign Policy Magazine. A member of two Pulitzer Prize winning teams, he has reported on U.S. military activities in Somalia, Haiti, Korea, Bosnia, Kosovo, Macedonia, Kuwait, Turkey, Afghanistan, and Iraq. He is the author of Fiasco, of Making the Core, A Soldier's Duty, a novel, and most recently, The Gamble. General David Petraeus and the American Military Adventure in Iraq, 2006 to 2008. Samantha Power could not be with us tonight due to an unavoidable scheduling conflict. We're delighted, proud to welcome our speakers this evening. Two final matters before we begin. First, I'm very pleased to note that funding for the Great Issues Forum was provided by the 2007 Carnegie Corporation's Academic Leadership Award presented to CUNY Chancellor Matthew Goldstein. We're deeply grateful to Carnegie and its president, Vartan Gregorian, as well as to Chancellor Goldstein. And second, and finally, permit me to please remind you to turn off your cell phones, any other electronic ticking devices you may have with you. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you to our panel. Professor uh, Weiss, the floor is yours. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you, Bob. Well, thanks, Bill, for the kind words of introduction. Um, and let me add my own warm wor words of welcome to this Humanities Series event. Uh, back in the dark ages when I was in nappies and I was watching the Vietnam War, um, it seems to me that there was much speculation about the waning of military power. Uh, and in the last 15 or 20 years, a small army of political scientists uh, following Joe Nye uh, have been looking at soft power. It seemed to me, however, that long before Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, it's evident that a military power, American or otherwise, remains the hard currency of international politics. And that's our subject this evening. There are endless avenues we could explore, but with my colleagues here, we decided to concentrate on four of them. We're going to start with the war in Iraq. We're then going to move to Afghanistan and the war on terrorism then to the notion of using military force in humanitarian emergencies, and finally taking a look at the media's influence on military power. The format will be like those we've used before. I'm gonna ask a question, introduce a question, and each panelist will have four, maybe five minutes to respond. He can then comment on the previous response, but we're gonna to try to move the conversation right along. Well, we're in an auspicious or perhaps inauspicious moment with a new president halfway through his magical first 100 days presiding over two wars. As Bill told us, we have three distinct voices, a retired uh, military officer with lots of experience, a decorated uh, journalist uh, who's had lots of experience commenting on these officials, and our friend uh, Alex who straddles advocacy and analysis. So I'm going to begin with the Iraq war. Um, we've now been there for six years. Uh, initially, American military power was very much on display, quickly did the job, supposedly. And now we've been there two years longer than we were in World War II, almost as long as we've been in Vietnam, approaching the American Revolutionary War, mired in counterinsurgency and with a witch's brew of religion and uh, ethnic and uh, tribal conflict. The price tag, 10 or $12 billion a month, 4,200 American dead soldiers, and uh, untold numbers of Iraqi. President Obama repeatedly stated his intention to withdraw and now has set a date for August 2010 to end combat operations. Now let me begin with uh, General McCaffrey. Uh, you've written that the end game is in sight. Um, I'd like to ask you what would that mean and what exactly would you tell President Obama to ensure a safe and timely withdrawal of forces, protecting them and protecting American interests in the region? Well, um, let me offer some ideas. First of all, I, I had a, a pretty good conversation with President-elect Obama about uh, Iraq and Afghanistan uh, and his other people, Susan Rice and uh, Tim Romer and uh, Bob Gates and uh, Secretary Clinton and, and others. Uh, so, you know, I put on my hat as an adjunct professor at West Point to try and stay in contact with this administration, the last one, uh, try and be nonpartisan, objective, informed, 
uh, to provide uh, useful views. And I'm in and out as uh, probably not near the extent that Tom Rex is, but in and out of both those conflicts on the ground. Uh, I'll spend a week, week there uh, in civilian clothes. Um, I'm old enough to be the grandfather to a lot of our young troops. Uh, I tell people my principal gift in life is tricking people into telling me the truth. Uh, the younger you are, the better I'm at it. If you're old and wily, it'll take me a little bit longer to uh, figure out what's really going on. So I end up with a uh, sort of a continuing um, informed perspective. Now, I don't know what's going to happen in Iraq. Um, you know, it was a, and unlike, there was a leg legitimate debate of whether we should have gone into Iraq with military power. It was elective warfare. We didn't have to do it. Uh, we had UNMOVIC. We had a, a political consensus to constrain Saddam. Uh, I personally thought it was worth taking him down when we did. I thought uh, left, um, left his own devices. He's going to beat the economic embargo. Uh, he was going to restart his weapons of mass destruction. Uh, and we'd end up doing it in the first years of the next administration. So I thought it was a good idea to go in. What I was appalled at was the incompetence, the arrogance, the misjudgments uh, with which we went about it. We actually know how to take down reasonably small countries, uh, 28 million people, biggest France and Germany combined, a million man active and reserve force. And we went in there with, uh, with a, a bunch of people who had never been shot at um, making micro decisions uh, so we went in without the, uh, the allies, without the uh, civil affairs, without the economic reconstruction, uh, with two and a half divisions uh, into this giant country uh, with no thought. By the way, when you're doing a military operation, which ought to be your last choice, the first thing you do is write down the objectives you think you're going to achieve. And then you design uh, your strategy to achieve those objectives. And then you select the force structure. And we did it the other way around. So we ended up in there with a, an, an Iraq that destroyed itself and ended up in civil war. And by the way, it destroyed itself. The U.S. Air Force didn't destroy Iraq. Uh, the Iraqis did. Uh, pent up rage against these uh, absolute sociopaths that had been governing the country. And then the worst thing of all that we did was um, people make bad assumptions. People come up with bad plans. But what you do is you listen to your feedback loops, and when it starts going wrong, you modify your strategy. And we ended up with this, uh, you know, Secretary Rumsfeld is a patriotic, brilliant, charismatic, uh, energetic, older, wealthy, experienced guy with atrocious judgment, um, <laughs> with, with an arrogance of such that he couldn't listen to people of lesser intellect. And many of his generals had lesser intellect. Uh, but he, he couldn't listen to them. They were plumbers, masters of their trade, Rick Shinseki. So then we, uh, we tried to deny the evidence in front of our eyes. It turned into a mess. Uh, now, I think, personally, about two years ago, Dave Petraeus, uh, Ray Odierno, Ryan Crocker, the ambassador, one of the best foreign uh, dip diplomats we've ever had in service. Uh, Bob Gates got in there, and the conversation at a strategic level changed dramatically within 30 days. My guess is uh, that Obama follows through, pulls us out largely in the next 36 months. If it works, we stay in perpetuity with small amounts of forces, 35,000. Uh, and that's likely to work, I hope, unless we go back to all-out civil war over the oil basin in Kirkuk between the Arabs and the Kurds, unless we go back to uh, the nightmare of uh, total criminal conduct in downtown Baghdad, most of the urban areas, Shia militias, on and on. We won't know, and I think we'll know by next Christmas whether, this is, whether we're going to pull this off. So the jury's out. It was badly exercised uh, <clears throat> option, and uh, it was shameful. And by the way, it's, I tell people it's not 4,000 dead. It's 36,000 killed and wounded. We've had okay. thousands of these uh, National Guard Reserve and active forces uh, with traumatic brain injury, multiple amputations. Uh, it's been a costly exercise, and it cost us $700 billion. So we'll see. I don't know where it's going. Tom, actually, he more or less has summarized your book, Fiasco, published in 2006. <laughs> <laughs> so that eliminates that question. But I, I, it seems to me in your most recent book that Bill mentioned, The Gamble, 
uh, that you come down pretty heavily in favor of a uh, tactical victory of major proportions uh, led by uh, General Petraeus. Um, and so I was interested that you did a public radio broadcast the other day and this comment that actually two people, two colleagues sent to me and said, we're going to be here longer than anyone thinks, end quote. And then I dipped into your book, and the last sentence is really uh, overpowering. It says, the events for which the Iraq War will be remembered probably have not yet happened. I'm guessing that for uh, all of the right-wingers in our audience, that may be good news, but most of the people in this audience, I presume, voted for the current president. Uh, they're not going to be happy with this. Is, am I correct? Is this your assessment of where we're going to be there for years? Yes, that's absolutely. And I think it's pretty evident at this point. Remember, President Obama has already broken his campaign promise, uh, which was to take out one brigade a month for 16 months. That's not going to happen. He will be president all of 09, and they're only planning on taking out two brigades during the 12 months of this year. So he's already thrown overboard that campaign promise. My starting point is rather different from General McCaffrey's, though. I think the American invasion of Iraq was the biggest mistake in the history of American foreign policy. It was a distraction from the war on terror. Uh, it had nothing to do with the war on terror, and I worry that actually what we wind up with in Iraq likely, and in sort of a best case scenario, uh, 10, 15 years out, is a smarter, tougher version of Saddam Hussein. And so when I hear Bush administration people say, well, at least we got rid of Saddam Hussein, I'm not sure you did. What you got rid of was an aging, toothless tiger who had no weapons of mass destruction, was no threat to his neighbors. What we may wind up with is somebody who harnesses the oil money, buys the weapons of mass destruction, and makes a bid for leadership of the Arab world on uh, a platform of vengeance against the West. Uh, I think the three things that Americans don't understand about the war right now are, number one, how hard the last couple of years were. The spring of 07 was not just, let's put a few thousand more troops out there. That was six months of very tough fighting. Uh, I think much harder than 04 when we had first and second Fallujah. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one outpost I read about in the book, Tarmia, had 38 soldiers in it in this little outpost, because the whole principle was not, let's throw in more troops, it was, let's protect the population. How do you do that? You have to move into, among the people. To do that, you needed more troops. So that's why, how they arrived at the notion of more troops. In Tarmia, there were 38 troops. This is north of Baghdad, about 20 miles, a little ugly town of the Tigris. They were car bombed one morning with a bomb so large that soldiers seven miles away heard it. But then they were hit by rocket propelled grenades, mortar fire, heavy machine gun fire. At the end of the day, two soldiers were dead, 29 were wounded, but they held the post. Uh, it was like an American version of the movie Zulu. That's the first thing I think Americans understand, just how hard it has been the last couple of years. Uh, a lot of people involved in this for the last couple of years were dissidents inside the military who would oppose the invasion. Ambassador Crocker reveals in my book that he actually was against the original invasion of Iraq. General Petraeus took command there, having just finished overseeing a counterinsurgency manual that amounted to a scathing critique of how the war had been handled for five years. Uh, a lot of these people thought, this is a tragic mistake, but let's try to do the best we can and they began with a lot of humility. The American way is not the only way. How can we do this differently? I think the second thing people don't understand is that the surge failed. It succeeded tactically to improve security, but the purpose as laid out by the president at the time and the secretary of defense was to improve security in such a way as to create a breathing space in which a political breakthrough would occur. Mm -hmm. Here we are with the surge over, troop numbers coming down, and none of the basic questions that vexed Iraq before the surge have been, have been solved. How do you share oil revenue? What's the relationship between Sunni, Shia, and Kurd? Um, what's the disposition of the city of Kirkuk? What is the role of Iran? Very influential in Iraq right now, probably the biggest single winner of any country in the region. Uh, and fundamentally, what is the shape of Iraqi government to be? Will it be a strong central government in Baghdad? Will it be a loose confederation? All of these questions have provoked violence in the past. All of them are likely to lead to violence in the future before they're resolved. And I think the third thing people don't understand is how stuck we are. I think President Obama is only slowly coming to grasp just how screwed he is. Um, 
he has inherited the worst foreign policy lineup I think any new president has ever taken on. And the scary thing about it is it isn't even his worst problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, that's just, a, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary problem set to take on. Now, I think he's quite capable. I think he does think strategically. But I think his Camp Lejeune speech about 10 days ago was more about staying in Iraq than getting out. Mm -hmm. uh, he quietly and really eloquently threw overboard a campaign promise <laughs> and laid out a plan to keep 35 to 50,000 troops there for several years until t the end of 2011. And now he said it's going to be a non-combat mission. Well, newsflash here, you can hang up a mission accomplished banner, you can call it a non-combat mission. As far as I'm concerned, as long as American troops are dying, it's a war. I was over at the White House actually the day of the President's speech and I said to a military official, are American troops still going to be dying after August 2010 when it's officially a non-combat mission? He said, yes, they will. Good news. Uh, Alex. You can see why John Stewart calls me Mr. Sunshine. The nature of military power in Iraq uh, shapes also the humanitarian landscape. And uh, depending on whose statistics we're looking at, the human toll has been gigantic. At least four and a half million people displaced, and who knows, 100,000, five times, 10 times that number to kill. I'd like you to tell us a little more about your own perception of the actual humanitarian condition for civilians on the ground, and to speculate where, whether under any of these scenarios it's actually going to be better or worse after a partial or a, a total American withdrawal. I guess, what's next? Well, I think the, the starting point of this is, is comparable to the um, lack of planning and foresight on the military and political side, there was a spectacular absence of any sort of planning on the humanitarian yes, side. I was, I was in USAID just a couple of weeks before the invasion, meeting with a couple of senior officials, mainly on other business, but who were in, to be involved in this. And I asked them what the plans were, and there weren't any. And it was, it was a, 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 another astonishing gap. Um, and this is a, a type of humanitarian crisis that was inevitable. It was quite foreseeable, and it, and it simply wasn't, wasn't planned for. And it was different in many respects to the, the humanitarian crises that we are familiar with from Africa, indeed from Afghanistan and, and, and Cambodia and places like that, in that it was a crisis in, 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 in a de essentially a developed society. It was a, it, was, it was a crisis in which it was necessary to get developed country-style infrastructure up and functioning. And of course, as we know, that, um, that simply wasn't done and, and, and remarkably still isn't done. I mean, it, 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 it's really still lacking. Um, and the extent of, of, of mortality, of number of fatalities, is a subject of huge controversy. And I really don't have an, a reliable opinion on that. I just, um, I find it very regrettable that there isn't a lot more transparency in allowing this topic to be, um, to be analyzed properly. Uh, but the numbers who have fled are, are also astronomical and the impact of that on, on the, uh, the human resources of Iraq, the, um, the capability for recovery, I think is, 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 is going to be very profound. But I want to make one other point, um, which I think is, 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 is picking up on, on, on what's already been mentioned, which is that when, in preparing my thoughts for this, I, I, I asked myself, you know, is this a, a unique military blunder? And the answer, of course, is that it's not. Um, and I look back at, at um, Barbara Tuckman's March of Folly, and she has this great sentence, the power to command frequently causes failure to think. And she goes back over the centuries giving examples of this. Our most recent example is, 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 is Vietnam, but she goes back to the Middle Ages. And then Gal Gabrielle Colco in Century of War has a great quotation, which I actually copied down, when he talks about the myopia of the men, I should say, it doesn't say women as well, men who led Europe into war. Um, their, their failure to anticipate all those factors that decide the results of war would have required an analytic clarity and honesty that political and military leaders rarely possess, and even when useful knowledge and intelligence existed precisely because it often revealed unfavorable conditions for attaining victory at acceptable costs, the career-oriented men who run states preferred to ignore it. And you know, what's new? Why do we keep deluding ourselves that we learn from history when quite clearly 
we don't. And <clears throat> if learning happens, it seems to happen during war by the men who get shot at. And then uh, 20 years later, that learning seems to be forgotten. Let me shift gears a little. We've already talked about Afghanistan and the war on terror. Uh, it's been a long time since uh, we heard that uh, cry, Nous sommes tous Américains, uh, which obviously evaporated quickly. And you've already pointed out how we didn't rely on enough allies in, in this effort. Uh, but the NATO force of 50,000 actually has 36,000 Americans, and we're now going to put 17,000 more on the ground for the summer and or the spring and summer season of, of conflict that usually breaks out. So General McCafferty, in light of our conversation, should we be actually be transferring assets from Iraq to Afghanistan? Um, and what actually, what would it take to win whatever winning would mean in Afghanistan? Well, you know, Afghanistan is an unusual case, a giant country, 14th century, um, we actually like these people a lot more, the, the troops on the ground, uh, than one would imagine. Uh, they're terrific soldiers. They're great businessmen. They're, you know, they're putting together a road network. They've started a film industry. They're, they're creating schools. They're remarkable people, given the cruelty and the chaos of their lives over the last 40, 50 years. Um, I have cautioned the, the administration coming in, don't go fight and win a counterinsurgency campaign in Afghanistan. You're in the wrong war. Uh, in the short run, and particularly since people on the ground have to wake up every morning and make decisions, uh, it may well be that we had to put 17,000 more troops in there because it was getting too dangerous. Uh, these people are now crossing the front. There's $4 billion of drug money flowing into the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, warlords, uh, militias, criminal organizations. Uh, these people are roaming around in battalion-sized units with REI camping gear, encrypted telecommunications, brand new automatic weapons. Uh, in the short run, we probably had to reinforce for security. Well, by the way, without security, you can't do nation building. Uh, but I personally think our instinct in this and, and President Obama's rhetoric in public during the campaign was uh, trying to be more muscular uh, than John McCain. And both of them, I think, had it wrong. Now, the key in Afghanistan, first of all, is to tell the American people uh, we're there for 25 years if you want to make a difference. And secondly, to say we can't do it unless it's an international operation. And third, to say it's not a military campaign, it's an attempt to build a nation uh, out of what's there. And then finally, I think uh, what you've got to do is you've got to create Afghan institutions. We don't like doing that. And by the way, the only tool that works in a lot of these situations, unfortunately, is the U.S. Armed Forces. Um, we, USAID, which I think was 18,000 people in Vietnam, is now a couple of thousand. We lack the institutions in the U.S. government outside the armed forces to, <clears throat> um, to create police forces and train them to create, uh, to, to manage nation building engineering activities. So it ends up getting handed back to the U.S. Armed Forces, who do it fairly well, to be honest. Uh, but we don't have, the, don't have the, the numbers to carry this out. So I, I fear, uh, Petraeus will sort this out. Within 60 to 90 days, we'll hear his viewpoints emerging. Uh, he won't misunderstand the situation. Uh, but there's been a lot of political rhetoric that's now on the table that might lead us in the wrong direction. Final thing, uh, you know, a trick question over an Army audience, I'll say, how many people are in active duty in the United States Army? And none of them get it right, because what they'll go to is the number. I think it's probably, we're headed toward 590 or something, but essentially the answer was 500,000. The smallest army since World War II, 1939, uh, when my dad was sworn in as an infantry lieutenant. Now, we managed to get this far because we called up the guard, the reserve, they went. We did, uh, some of these kids are on their fourth or fifth combat tours. We did stop loss. We pulled in the IRR, guys that were out there uh, as uh, prison psych, my escort in, in Afghanistan three or four years ago, been out of uniform for 20 some odd years, a lieutenant colonel. He couldn't remember what unit he had served in in Vietnam. You know, I asked him, did they have a horse on the patch? Do you remember that? Um, so, you know, 
it's just been a desperate struggle. And by the way, we, uh, a lot of them got killed or wounded. Uh, so we have barely made it. There were 44 brigades. In theory, we're building more. Uh, you, we had, uh, at one point, we had, what, 18 in Iraq. Now we're down, we're headed to 12. Um, we're on the margin. Uh, so I, it bothers me to hear this zero-sum <laughs> game of turning the fire hose from Iraq to Afghanistan. Afghanistan could be a bigger mistake than Iraq, a bigger mistake. One rule, I got a lot of rules, you know, in life, you know, rules on what colleges your kids can go to. They can't be within 100 miles of a warm beach. Uh, <laughs> um, but an, another rule I've got is the U.S. Army shouldn't go anywhere where we can't walk down to the sea and find the U.S. Navy. We're 600 miles from the sea. Uh, we're surrounded by, if, you know, without Pakistan Air Base, without Karachi, uh, the whole thing comes apart. Now we're building supplementary ways to get into Afghanistan. So we've got to think carefully. The Obama administration doesn't want to take on, in my view, a 25-year counterinsurgency campaign in Afghanistan. Alex, can we, we sort of switch back to the humanitarian side here for a minute? Because um, initially there were enormous casualties in October, November, December of 2001, and those actually diminished considerably. But then in 2007, we saw a spike last year, uh, again up by about 50%. Uh, and I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the people who, who try to come to the rescue and some of the issues they face. Um, at least the ones I speak to are quite uh, uneasy about uh, being so closely associated with a military uh, occupation in Iraq and whatever they describe it in Afghanistan. And this was not helped by... Colin Powell's uh, quotation that called uh, humanitarians force multipliers and an important part of our combat team. This doesn't exactly help with neutrality and partiality if those are relevant concepts. Well, they have a, have a couple of problems, and, and, and one of them is exactly the problem that you've mentioned, of trying to operate under the umbrella of, of, of a foreign military power and inevitably being associated with that and the challenges to neutrality and impartiality, basically insuperable challenges at the end of the day um, that arise from that. But another challenge is associated with the, the, the ambitious mission um, that the general laid out, uh, the idea that we're all involved in state building. And the the, the, the contribution that most of the humanitarians and, and indeed the development workers would like to make to building you know, sustainable livelihoods, sustainable institutions, and, and, and creating a, a, a new Afghanistan that can stand on its own feet. Because if we, I mean, frankly, if we define the exit strategy from Afghanistan in terms of we will be able to leave the country when there is a viable state with a uh, service institutions that can deliver basic goods to the people, when the state itself is sufficiently strong and autonomous to be able to manage the inevitable political disputes and conflicts that arise within Afghanistan, then staying 25 years is a very, very optimistic scenario. It's going to take a heck of a lot longer. And all, the, you know, all these ideas about building police forces, they're all well and good. But the reality is that we are defining Afghanistan by what it's not. We're defining it by it's not a state like our state. And we want to make it like our state. Well, it hasn't, no, it's never been like that. I mean, maybe one day it will become like that. But a key piece of analysis is missing, which is how, how does it function when it does function? Mm -hmm. And um, that analysis is, is not difficult. Do. You can actually look at how Afghans, um, how the, the political elites, the people who have um, command over militias, over cartels, over companies, how they operate. And it's all, um, my, my favorite metaphor here is, is an auction place of loyalties. It's all to do with, with bargaining. And, and Afghans are, like many people around the world, very, very skilled at the business of transacting loyalty in a political marketplace. And when 
a successful operation, like the operation of 2001, to, to, to remove the Taliban is mounted. A major part of that is actually just buying out the warlords. And we think of that as a sort of you know, rather unpleasant sort of hidden side of the military activity. But as far as the Afghans, the, the, very, the few that I know or the people that have worked in Afghanistan, um, will tell me is actually that's the, m the more central part. And we actually ought to be thinking about the project of, in Afghanistan, not in terms of building a, you know, a state that looks like ours. That certainly should come. But in terms of stabilizing this political marketplace as a precondition, getting the levels of violence down, reducing the role of violence as a key tool in that political bargaining to, to, um, to, for where, whereby militia leaders and so on make themselves um, very attractive and indispensable. Um, and that type of analysis, that sort of political ethnography of how it actually functions, um, is, is, is not yet in place. But let me just um, add, add one more thing, which is the, 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 the other historian that I consulted. Uh, before, before, b before coming here, wrote, it was a, a British historian called Norman Dixon who wrote a book with a self-explanatory title on the psychology of military incompetence. And he, out of patriotism, draws all his case studies from the, the great British army. And he says this is the great rich British military tradition provides plentiful examples for, for, for studying the psychology of military incompetence. And, 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 he, and he looks at um, a number of the three great cases in which the, the only three cases apparently in which the British, great British army was forced to entirely evacuate a territory, one being the United States. The second one being Afghanistan, where only one man survived from the, 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 uh, the British expeditionary force that went in there in, 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 in the 1840s. And, and, and he, he, he points out that one of the great um, misguided conceptions of the military planners is, is that the, the fellow on the other side is, is afraid of dying in the way that you are. Could I take a moment to clean I, up? Actually, I want to continue with you on Afghanistan because uh, we found out this evening that Tom has a, is a card-carrying member of the ski patrol in Afghanistan from 1969. Uh, and, and so uh, there are other very few people in this room who have that claim to fame. So I wondered whether we could continue this a bit. And, and if you could think through what would improved governance or improve human rights in the context that you've reported on in Afghanistan, what would that actually mean? Well, it does. It follows exactly on the, the comments that we've just heard here. Uh, going back to your Gabriel Coco quote, I find it kind of arrogant because it's the hardest thing in the world that I know of is to see what's happening in wartime. There's a reason that the most famous quote from Clausewitz is the fog of war. It is enormously difficult. Orwell says the hardest thing to see is what's happening in front of your eyes. And I think Orwell speaks partly as a journalist but also as a veteran uh, of fighting in Spain. Mm -hmm. What happened over the last couple of years in Iraq is pretty much what you're describing. This, a key aspect of the surge was Petraeus went in and put the Sunni insurgency on the American payroll. 100,000 guys, $30 million a month. Uh, it was actually the most stunning moment of my interviews for the book is when I said to him, how exactly did you sell President Bush on this idea? <laughs> and he said, I didn't. And I said, General Petraeus, this is probably the biggest policy shift in the war in the last few years. <laughs> He said, it was within my existing authorities. <laughs> uh, as General McCaffrey knows, audacity is a good requirement to have in general. He also knew that he was, he was really risking his entire career. If that had gone wrong, it would have blown up in his face. He would have been blamed. I think you'll see him do the same thing, go into the, the, what you call the, au the auction place of, the, of politics and loyalties, and find common ground. Not, will you become a Jeffersonian Democrat, but how much will it cost in projects or money or whatever you want for you to stop shooting at my people. Now, I think invading Afghanistan was exactly the right thing to do, and I speak as someone who lived there and loves the country. Uh, it was the right response to al-Qaeda. I think what you're seeing with the Obama administration uh, is also the right strategic approach, which is look at it as the Afghan-Pakistan war, in which of those two arenas, Pakistan's the more important. Uh, if Afghanistan <laughs> falls apart, it would be awful for the Afghans we could live with it, uh, as long as it didn't become a base for al-Qaeda again. If Pakistan falls apart, you have Islamic extremists 
nuclear weapons mixing up. And that's a very worrisome outcome. That's Al-Qaeda's number one goal, our number one nightmare. Uh, so I think they're looking at it the right way as a regional war that's only going to have regional solutions that have to come from the people there. We've tried American solutions, and guess what? They don't work. Uh, we've learned that the hard way. So I think the policy is basically for both countries, try to keep the lid on. Kick the can down the road. It's no, not the most satisfying of policies, and it certainly is not something that Americans sign up. That's a great idea. Let's kick the can down the road. But it's about as good as you're going to get to let local solutions emerge. Let the Pakistani military stop being part of the problem and find a way to make it start being part of the solution. That's where you're going to find, ultimately, humanitarian aid comes from is stability <clears throat> and security. Now, my problem with all this, though, is the extreme over-optimism of President Obama on Iraq. His whole thinking is, let's get troops out of Iraq so we can get them into Afghanistan. Well, A is not going to happen, so B is not going to happen. And B is important right now, partly because our allies in Afghanistan, the police and the army, are part of the problem also. One thing we want to do is get troops out there, not only to keep the Taliban off the people's back, but to keep the Afghan police off of people's backs. Right now, when you drive from Spin Boldak on the uh, southern border up to Kandahar, I'm told there are five police shakedowns in about 120 miles. You can't run an economy that way. But if you have American troops out there, you, if you can diminish the corruption by 50 percent, the shakedowns by 50 percent, the economy starts working better. Barry, you wanted to jump uh, in a minute. I just think I, I, I endorse what Tom is saying, but to sort of add to the challenges in, in uh, Pakistan, we've had a lot of uh, public rhetoric to include out of the incoming team about cross-border operations and taking muscular responses to sanctuaries in Waziristan, the Fata, and Baluchistan. And, you know, I think many people argue that Pakistan is not a nation. It's four nations under one weak federal state. The only load-bearing institution is the army. And the army is also the ISI. And the army is also the Frontier Corps. And the army provides bureaucrats to run universities. Um, and the army can't tolerate a foreign invasion into an area that they've never controlled, the Brits never controlled. It was a tribal area. So when I stood up in the Khyber Pass with this terrific young brigadier general, four combat tours, tremendous cards, he said, look, these frontier guards are letting these people uh, cross back and forth over the border. The exact wrong instinct, in my view, is to say, well, let's go fight them over there. Now, deniable CIA operations, that's different. Uh, we can, uh, we can uh, do fairly aggressive measures, but you just can't it seems to me, even begin to consider uh, military operations against Pakistan. If you do, they, the, the army has to walk away from us. They close uh, Karachi. Uh, they close their airspace, and it's end game. Thank you. Actually, this could go on for a long time, but I'm going to try to now shift gears a little uh, to think about the use of military power to protect human beings, specifically the case of, of Darfur. Um, at the World Summit in 2005, 150 princes and presidents and prime ministers agreed to something called the responsibility to protect and said that the Security Council really should move quickly to authorize the use of military force, if necessary, to protect human beings. Um, the normative advance has been substantial. Obviously, the progress on the ground has been a little less so. Um, we can name a number of targets, but I think the situation in Darfur with, again, the numbers, Alex, will 200, 300,000 dead, two, two and a half, three million displaced. But in any case, uh, the Congress, in the only uh, unanimous decision ever, called it a genocide. Um, and the past president called this a genocide, as did the Secretary of State. I really don't want to get into the legal hair splitting about genocide, yes, no, or maybe. But it's clear that mass atrocity crimes uh, have taken place there. Early on, uh, 2002 or 3, you actually thought this might be a sensible idea to, to utilize military force. You moved back from that saying that absolutely the only solution is political negotiations. Uh, and uh, more recently, you've also thought that, that even the, the indictment of the president, and, and yesterday you sent me an email about um, God help us, not a, a, a no-fly zone. 
Um, so are, what are the situations under which American or any other kind of military power could actually usefully foster humanitarian objectives? It has to be very, very precisely tailored to the context. Um, if we look at Darfur, um, nine, some of the way between 90 and 95% of the people who were killed in Darfur were killed between June of 2003 and December of 2004, a few little bit into, in, into January 2005. Um, since then, the situation changed really quite, um, quite radically. And at that point, when at the height of atrocities, even a very small monitoring force could make a difference, and actually did make a difference. Um, the, in, in, in April of 2004, um, to coincide, actually, ironically, with the 10th anniversary of the Rwanda genocide, a, a ceasefire was negotiated under considerable pressure from the US government. And it was actually a very unheralded achievement because um, I said that something like 93-odd percent of the, the killings occurred in, in that approximately 80 18-month period. Well, of that 93%, more than 90% occurred before um, that ceasefire, which didn't stop the war, but it stopped most of the atrocities, and it was associated with the deployment of a very, very small group of, of African Union military observers. And I think one of the first lessons that we have to learn is actually that in these contexts, um, there's a strategic choice, really, a, 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 about what approach you take. You can take an overwhelming force approach or you can take a very light footprint approach. And the evidence that I've seen suggests that the light footprint approach is just as effective as a heavy force. And that even having a, a relatively small number of, of military observers and a small protection force for them can actually do a lot to bring down the violence. It brought it down by you know, a very considerable um, uh, degree associated with a number of other factors as well, including humanitarian presence. Um, so that limited military role actually was, was very, very um, effective. And I think that the, the, the concept of R2P can also be, responsibility to protect, can also be taken in different directions. It can either mean that when you have a peacekeeping force, as say in Srebrenica or in the Darfurian town of Muhajiria just a couple of months ago, that force is, when necessary, authorized to use force. Um, it, it is not prohibited from using force by its mandate. And of course, in Srebrenica, they decided we're not going to use it. Our mandate doesn't allow it, and we know what happened. In the case of Mohajiria, again, successes don't often get told in these stories. In Mohajiria, the African troops who were there said, we're not going to leave. And actually, the, the, the deputy force commander, uh, a Rwandese said, I, I, if, if we are required to leave, and the instruction was actually coming from the Secretary General, who hasn't been terribly heroic on these topics, um, but they should leave, um, he said, I'm going to quit and publicly quit. And most of the senior staff within the joint, the hybrid UNAU mission, joined him. And um, fortunately, the, the, the instruction had not been formalized at that point. And, and there were other factors going on too, but they stayed. And the very fact that they threatened, yes, we will use force if necessary, was actually instrumental in protecting about 5,000 displaced people who congregated in the vicinity of that area. So the, the government moved back in, the, the, the rebels withdrew, the government moved back in, and actually nobody died in that particular operation, which no one reported it because nothing happened. And um, so that is a success. However, if what you see as the responsibility to protect is a comprehensive you know, policing operation in which all the civilians are protected, it ain't going to work. And I think this is one of the, 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 the problems that we've had in Darfur. I was, in my capacity, advising the, the, the African Union. I was involved in the security negotiations over the security arrangements for Darfur, and we drafted in um, a fair number of military experts, including a number of former African guerrillas. Uh, and um, we basically, you know, we sat down, and there were two basic options on the table. One option which every one of the military advisors was in favor of, given the situation on the ground at the time. Remember, the level of violence has dropped by about 90%. We have about maybe 150 people being killed every month, of whom about 
Uh, of that 150, about 60 or so are civilians killed by the Army, Air Force, and militia. About 40 odd are combatants, and the other 50 are killed in intertribal clashes, usually among the Arabs. I mean, it's not often known that, the, in actual numerical terms, more Arabs than, quotes, Africans are being killed every month in Darfur, um, and mainly fighting each other. Um, it's to do with this factor of, of, of how much does it cost to rent a militia, and when the, uh, when the government isn't renting them, then they, then they go freelance and tend to attack their neighbors who tend to be other Arab militias. Um, and um, incidentally, one of the reasons why the, 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 the humanitarian agencies were dispossessed was that the government needed to resupply, renew, needed to renew its rental contracts, and it was running short of money because the oil price has gone down. So it's helpful to have to be able to confiscate cars from International Rescue Committee and hand them over to the Janjaweed, keep them happy for a, another 18 months, which is why they won't go much further, I suspect, because they, want, you know, they don't want to pay them all in one lump sum. They want to keep some in reserve for paying out in, in, in a year's time, etc. Um, the economics are driving this in, in quite interesting ways. But sorry, that's getting off my, my topic. The, 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 the preferred option of all the military advisors was a low footprint operation, probably about between three and 4,000 troops. Um, a couple of probably three rapid response battalions, mm -hmm. and most of them just small groups less than company size, um, and led by military liaison officers, working with the local communities, using them as the force multiplier. The objective being to get all of, the, all of these local militia un, into some regular relationship with the, the, the international um, presence there, so that, we, so that you knew what was going on and you could predict and respond accordingly, because um, that was the major problem. The other option, and they, they, they came with their equations and so on of how many troops per square mile per village, et cetera. They said, you'll need 200,000 troops mm -hmm. to do the job comprehensively. And that wasn't an option. But politically, but it also wasn't politically an option to do it with 3,000 because there were 7,000 African Union troops who weren't doing the job. So the whole international clamor was, we want more. And for the assembled experts to say, no, we want less, was not going to fly politically. So a, a purely political compromise was worked out, which is we want 20,000 or so. And that was derived from various calculations about implementing the peace agreement. But the same numbers and the same force structure was then transferred to a situation without a peace agreement to do civilian protection. And it's actually a complete nonsense. This, even when it is fully deployed, this, this UN African mission in Darfur with 26,000, won't be able to do, to do that at all. Well, Tom, may I ask you, since you're a commentator on U.S. politics as well as uh, the military, um, Mrs. Ogata, who was the High Commissioner for Refugees, always said there was no humanitarian solution to a humanitarian problem. Alex mentioned the term political will. Um, what kind of political will do you think exists in the United States to get involved in such situations? I mean, rhetorically, we're pretty good on this, but uh, to put however lightly clad the boots are on the ground, is there any sense that this would fly in Washington these days? Absolutely not. Uh, zip, zero, nada. Americans are sick of the messes we've created, let alone going into new messes. Um, what strikes me right now is I knock around the country talking about my book is the number of people who have said to me things like, I don't care if genocide occurs in Iraq. I want to get out. Just leave. Uh, so either there's a willingness to tolerate a whole lot of messes overseas without us being involved in them in any way. That said, if you do have to get involved, I think what Alex laid out is exactly right. Small is better than big. Local is better than foreign. And there's no such thing as a humanitarian solution. There's no such thing as a military solution. Mm -hmm. All solutions must be political. And so uh, military, use of military force is only useful insofar as it leads to a political solution. Mm -hmm. The best use of military force is not the actual expenditure of force, it's the threat of force. The problem with that is you should never make a threat you're not willing to follow up. <laughs> yeah. and, and if I could just jump sure. in. I mean, this is the problem with the ICC. The International Criminal Court, you're basically, you know, 
you are threatening regime change through judicial activism. There's no other way of getting the guy. And the Sudan government sees this as the first declaration of war to be followed up by military action. Now, no one has a serious intention of carrying this out. So you have made an empty threat, and you have put the Sudan government on a war footing. Um, and you're not prepared mm -hmm. to, yeah. to overthrow it by force. You've lost your leverage, and, and you don't have a military option. So it's an instrumental, not a principled argument on your part. Yeah. Yeah, OK. Uh, Barry, may I just ask you how you react to this notion of a light footprint? Um, this is not something the US military uh, has, as far as I can recall. Uh, would this be an argument for a different kind of division of labor with Europeans uh, getting more involved in this kind of operation or regional forces getting more involved and the US military providing logistics or something else? Well, yeah, I, I can't tell you the level of anxiety the discussion over the last five minutes provoked in my <laughs> back of my head. Um, the last thing anyone should do is start off talking about the size of the footprint. That is a dependent third order variable. The first thing you have to do is talk about what are you trying to achieve. And by the way, you have to force yourself through the intellectual rigor of writing it down and then deducing from that what are the measures that have to be carried out and then you select a strategy to go after those measures and then you decide what people you put in the ground. And I would, uh, having been in a senior position during Srebrenica and Rwanda and Iraq and other interventions and Haiti, Haiti is a classic example. You know, we got in there, and the poor Haiti, I've got a soft spot in my heart for Haiti. It's the most miserable place on the face of the earth. Incredible uh, cruelty, incompetence, uh, no institutions at work. I wasn't, as the drug policy director, I was never particularly worried about it being a major drug uh, uh, channel into the United States because it's too dangerous to go there as a Colombian. <laughs> I mean, I remember the mayor of one of the little towns being uh, shot dead by his bodyguard as they had a fight over the drugs on a yacht that they had seized um, that had come into port. So we get into Haiti, we start them on the renaissance of their entire national history. We had a tiny footprint on the ground, uh, NATO, uh, UN cops, Argentine uh, constabulary, uh, one rifle company from the 82nd Engineers, some special ops, and I listened to exit strategy out of the Clinton administration because we're going to save $28 million or something uh, by pulling this force out. I said, you know, for God's sakes, it's a lot cheaper to keep those people there than it is to deal with the millions who are soon going to be up here if you have chaos in Haiti. Uh, Srebrenica in itself was a huge mistake, and part of it was force structure. It's also rules of engagement. It's also perceived political will. But it wasn't just their ROE. They were incompetent, inadequately equipped, undermanned force, and thousands died. Um, I watched this debate, the Rwanda situation, hundreds of thousands being slaughtered. It was my personal, professional opinion that we could have intervened and stopped the slaughter easily. That was not a big deal. Uh, we would have required a substantial force on the ground, a lot of political will, some tough ROE, but you had to go tell the American people what you're about to do. And correctly, the assessment was, as it is with Darfur, we're not going to do it. So what you end up with the political leadership doing is trying to bargain the military into doing, uh, and it, by the way, one of the challenges we've got as Americans coming out in the coming 10 years is a debate about what kind of military leaders do you want. We, we, when you look at our forces in the field, our tactical leadership, our one and two star generals have been on continuous operations for 15 years. They're unbelievable. The generals in the Pentagon, generals, admirals, are a different elk. Uh, our model was built on seven days in May. These people might seize the country at midnight. Who would want to seize this country is beyond me. <laughs> And the real debate is what kind of people do you want uh, and what role do you want them to play with the civilians? And I think uh, that's where Rumsfeld with his, uh, and some of these intellectually brilliant people uh, led us astray. And the generals failed us, you know, in my view. Many of them, they didn't. 
Uh, they made arguments, and they finally backed off and said, gee, these people must know what they're doing. It doesn't look right to us, but uh, we'll go along with it. So footprints, a bad discussion. We went into Somalia with a first-rate team led by a Marine three-star general. Uh, we stocked them in the head. Uh, the violence came to an abrupt halt. We started feeding people. Then we withdrew, put a tiny multinational force on the ground uh, that was militarily incompetent with bizarre rules of engagement. And then we had a tiny U.S. Uh, special ops group start to take violent action against a nation of warriors. Mm -hmm. It was a recipe for disaster. You know, we had the wrong footprint on the ground. Yep. So don't talk about footprint, talk about what you're trying to achieve. I did correctly sense that you were uncomfortable with footprint and exit strategy. That's why <laughs> oh, I've, you know, I've you. heard this discussion at 2 o'clock in the morning yep. many times uh, with a room full of people discussing what caliber of artillery we will allow on the ground. And I'll tell people, stay out of this. It's yes. not your business, for God's sakes. Tell us what you want us to achieve. We went into, we had Tommy Franks in, in uh, Rumsfeld denying access to New Afghanistan for the tools to do okay. our job. Alex, 30 seconds I on just this, and then I'm going to switch gears. Um, the discussion, I mean, the, the key debate that we had over this was what is the objective? And the, the objective, as articulated, was that a political solution has to be found at several levels. Mm -hmm. And the key role of whatever forces that would be put in would be to facilitate that political stabilization at the local level. And working back from that, we said, you know, more than 3,000 ain't going to do it. You keep it very, very light. Mm -hmm. And the, the, but the, the whole debate publicly was about numbers, yeah. which was a ludicrous debate. I'm going to shift gears. Sorry, I'm, we're moving along here for our last topic, though, which is the, the media. Uh, we've talked about the use of force, and I'd, I'd like to spend a moment on the media. I mean, traditionally, bombs and bullets have been part of this business, but um, I came upon a, a good quote, uh, which is the reason we're in an educational institution, from Victor Hugo, who said, a stand can be made against invasion by an army. No stand can be made against an invasion by an idea. It seems to me that the media fights in the trenches of ideas, or if I can mix a few metaphors here. Um, and I'm wondering uh, whether, Tom, you could tell us your, your own uh, unvarnished, typically, uh, impressions uh, about the, the notion of the media's responsibility at this point in time and whether we got where we are because we got there, including the military's reporting on uh, these events? I think the whole country was knocked off balance by 9-11, and that included the media. I think there was a national panic after 9-11, and I think that led directly to the invasion of Iraq. In normal circumstances, were this, the nation's institutions working correctly, I don't think the invasion of Iraq would have happened. I think we're all kind of, as a nation, kind of waking up from a national drunk and uh, saying, geez, what happened? Who made this mess? Well, guess what? Last night, honey, you did it. Um, and the media was part of that. My actual feeling, though, is the media aside, you know, you have a local newspaper here that screwed it up to a fare the well, the New York Times. But um, putting aside the sins of the New York Times and their coverage of weapons of mass destruction, uh, I think the media actually did a pretty good job in putting out the facts in front of the American people before the invasion. I remember my editor said to me one day, Tom, how many stories do you plan to write about the doubts generals have about invading Iraq? <laughs> and I said, you're getting sick of them? He said, yeah. And he said, uh, this war is going to happen. You need to write more about what's going to happen and less about how the Pentagon and generals are so reluctant to do it. Um, once we went into Iraq, I thought the media did a very good job, a, a really good job. Uh, and I'm thinking especially of people like Anthony Shadid, an Arabic speaker colleague of mine, who went out and spent time with Iraqis talking about the occupation. During the summer of 03, Anthony would come back from a, I was embedded with the 1st Armored Division. He was embedded with the radical clerics in, uh, in Sadr City. And we'd come back and compare notes every night. And I think we're the only two people in Iraq doing this, talking to the generals and to Muqtadr al-Sadr, and then comparing notes every night. And Anthony had this Arabic, um, 
a phrase he'd, he'd use, the mud is getting wetter. And he used that all that summer of 03, the mud is getting wetter. And it was just such an ominous phrase that really captured it. The odd thing, I think, for the last couple of years, the media has not done a good job on Iraq. And I think when the surge began, the media really lost the bubble. For several years, they had been ahead of the government and the military in understanding the situation. And then they didn't understand counterinsurgency. They didn't know how to cover it. They confused increasing casualties with uh, American setbacks when actually it meant Americans were engaging the problem in, in the correct way for the first time, exposing themselves because they were saying, let's protect Iraqis. Uh, so, for example, the Haditha massacre in 05 wouldn't have happened under the new regime because the Haditha massacre, 24 Iraqi civilians were killed and nobody reported it up the chain of command as a SIG act, a significant action. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it wasn't considered important. It was considered the cost of doing business. Uh, where we are now, though, is the media uh, is pulling out of Iraq. You know the old 60, 1960s phrase, suppose they gave a war and nobody came? Well, that's what we're getting in Iraq. We gave a war and the American people have walked out on it. But just because you walk out of a movie halfway through doesn't mean it ends. Hmm. What the troops ask me when I'm out there is, does anybody know we're still out here? There's still, last time I looked, I think there's about 140,000 American troops in Iraq. That's more than we've had on average for the last six years. This war is about to become, it's, seven, it's going to its seventh year. This is going to be the longest war in American history. Yeah. And Americans are thinking it's over, and it ain't. And I think the media is part of that problem right now, partly because the media, my newspaper industry, is collapsing. There are very few bureaus full-time staffed in Baghdad anymore. It's the Washington Post, the New York Times, NPR, and I don't think any of the TV networks now have full-time correspondents there. <clears throat> uh, people are leaving. And so we actually, the imperial... Uh, mission continues, yeah. but, but, the, but the Americans have sort of right, yeah. uh, gotten bored. Okay. General McCaffrey, uh, I think we're talking about what the media does. I think we should also to talk who, who is in it, and there are individuals like you who have specialized knowledge. I, I actually don't have any data on this, but as a consumer, I have the impression that since the Persian Gulf War, senior military folks like yourself are playing a larger and larger role as, as commentators. Do you, is this a positive development, a negative development? What are the pluses and minuses of being associated with the media industry? The, um, you know, my dad was a soldier for 37 years. He had nine years in combat and four wars. He never voted. Uh, he was uh, the, the number two guy in command of the Army for, in Vietnam for four years, and they never protested uh, McNamara, uh, who later writes a book and explains uh, they knew from the start this war was uh, misguided, couldn't be achieved. And so my generation, having been wounded in action three times in Vietnam, 58,000 dead, 303,000 wounded, was an astonishing different culture. Um, my own view, by the way, plain and simple, was the day I retired, I regained all my political rights to run for office, uh, give candidates money to speak out, um, I'm a determinedly nonpartisan commentator, um, and um, you know my son and my daughter are in uniform. Uh, son in combat uh, three times. So, I, and when I looked at the um, almost with disbelief at what the civilian leadership was doing to the country, uh, it was clear to me that uh, I was going to take a public position on it, um, and I certainly don't regret it. Now, I think. Again, part of the debate ought to be, you know, and by the way, some of that was a failure. I, you know, my wife used to say, how come people are paying so much, so much attention to you? You know, <laughs> and I said, well, Rumsfeld has made me a national figure, you know, a modestly intelligent uh, uh, retired military officer, and my viewpoints were dead on the, on the subject from the start. I was in and out of that building, you know, I went in and saw him one-on-one -on -one and said, you know, Mr. Rumsfeld, you know, I said, uh, I was a uh, extremely untalented but undefeated college boxer, and the reason I never lost fights, this was before we went in, was because I went into these, op uh, these fights scared to death, and I want you and your senior people to approach these issues the same way. When you pick up military tools, you don't know the outcome. 
There's an intelligent enemy on the other side of the equation. So we went in demeaning our enemies, which was asinine. As so the second reason was, when, you, when I got in the ring, uh, my coach, later killed in action in Vietnam as a Medal of Honor recipient in the Marine Corps, would tell us, and that gong goes off, you step into the ring and try and kill your opponent with the first punch and dominate the fight from the outset. He said, if you do, uh, you won't have problems with these fights. And by the way, that doesn't mean just military power. In Iraq, it would have meant intervention with 3,000 18-wheeler trucks loaded with humanitarian supplies and Saudi military units. And uh, so, I don't know. I, I took a very uh, public uh, role commenting on it. I've done a lot of writing. I, I try and tell people, you know, you're dealing with a, an academic. I'm a professor at West Point. Uh, that's the, the nature of the reports I write, and, uh, and I, I feel pretty comfortable about it. And by the way, it was a lonely voice there for a long time. There were a handful of print reporters like Tom Rex that figured out what was going on, and uh, an awful lot of people. Congress failed in their duties. Article 1 of the Constitution says the Congress shall raise and support an Army and Navy and, and validate who gets in high military office and just incredible failure to include by the media. I want to, want to tell one quick anecdote that just, I've never said this in public before, but you brought it to mind. Uh, during that very lonely period, when I was actually banned from Rumsfeld's airplane, yeah. all my interviews were cut off, I sat down and talked to David Halberstam one day okay, and said, the president tried to get you fired out of your job at the New York Times covering Vietnam. What do you do? I mean, I, I, sort of, I feel very you know, besieged here. How do you handle it? And he had such a great response. He said, suck it up. <laughs> OK. So, so I did. <laughs> well, um, we're, we're going to conclude in just a few minutes. And um, I wanted to ask the same question of each of you. And if you could take just a minute or a minute and a half to answer this. I'm going to start with you, Alex, and then Tom, and end up with uh, Barry McCaffrey. Uh, and you, I'm doing this because you started this earlier, and you say, you know, we've got to learn lessons. And so I was going to ask each of you to sort of tell me, and, and in an institution like this, and my, my impression is that of myself and my colleagues, we get really invested in the stuff we write, we go and print on, and then we get a little defensive about what we've said in the past. And um, I came upon a really wonderful quote the other day from uh, Mahbub ul haq who was the inventor of the sort of human development report, brilliant Pakistani economist who actually roomed with Amatya Sen. It must have been a terrific uh, double at, uh, at Cambridge. But anyway, he said, you know, it's too late to agree with me. I've already changed my mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, so, but what I'd like to query you about is give me the example of the, the sort of either the worst idea, the worst theory, the worst decision you made, and tell me a little bit about the process of changing your mind. You know, what kinds of data, what kinds of views from friends actually tips the balance and you change your mind? I'm going to start with you, Alex, because you've actually written about humanitarians learning no lessons. Um, I think that the... Um, the, the position which I, 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 I probably shifted on, and I, perhaps it is to do with the humanitarians learning lessons, was that um, during and, and after the, the Rwanda genocide, I, I argued very strongly that the humanitarians had, had made a great blunder in focusing on, on the humanitarian crisis and ignoring the politics of the genocide, and that this, in turn, was uh, compounding the political problems. Um, and I, I don't regret saying what I, what I said um, and, 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 and challenging them at that point. But I think uh, be careful what you wish for because what we've seen um, in the last few years in, 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 in the case of Darfur is that the, that humanitarian constituency or in the broadest sense has become very politicized. Um, and is taking political analysis and its political positions very, very seriously. 
And while in, 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 in the case of Rwanda, I was saying, you know, what's happened to justice? Justice has been lost. I think we now have run, gone to the other extreme. And we have a situation in which uh, the, the call for justice and the, call, and the call for political action to enforce ideals has got out of balance with the other considerations. So we have a prosecutor of the International Criminal Court who demands the arrest warrant of President Bashir, saying that it may be two years or 20 years before he is brought to court. Um, and in his last report to the Security Council, in the section, Interest of the, the Victims, he says there are three million victims in Darfur. He says, I've consulted with some of the victims and they're all in favor of this. Well, I suspect that the, these three million victims, um, that their interests are not necessarily well served by the fact that the prosecutor has demanded that uh, President Bashir and essentially his whole government surrender with no option of backing down, no room for compromise. Um, you know, room, you know Diplomacy 101, give the other guy an option of, 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 of a way out. This guy has no way out, act of war, etc. What does he do? Immediately, you know, food and medicine to a large number of these three million is uh, being cut off. So, um, Tom, an error. I can tell you the exact time and place. It was May 2007 in the Green Zone. And I was sitting and talking to this Australian named David Kilcullen, a former infantryman, PhD in anthropology, expert on Islamic extremism and its the natures of violence. Now, I had thought the surge was the wrong idea. Nothing I had seen in Iraq told me the US military would be able to pull it off. I had not seen, especially leadership at the general officer level, capable of doing what the theory called upon them to do. And so I was out there. And I was surprised at what I was seeing, which was actually platoon leaders, company commanders saying, well, in my little sector, where we're camped out, I'm seeing these differences. So then I went into the green zone to talk to Kill Cullen. And he was describing the situation in Baghdad. Remember, this is four years into the war. And in the middle of it, I thought, my god, for the first time in my life, I'm sitting in the green zone, and somebody is telling me what's happening in Baghdad, and he understands the city better than I do, because I live out there in the, in the red zone. And that was a real moment for me when I thought, man, they might be able to pull this off. Now, I think, still think the surge failed politically, but that was the first time I even thought they would be able to improve security. And it was a revelation to me. And it changed my attitude that summer in the reporting. Mm -hmm. um, looking how things played out. Gary, the last word's yours. Well, you know, I, I had uh, three combat tours as a lieutenant and, and captain. And uh, I tell people when I came out of that experience, my wife now of 45 years hated American politicians, reporters, and generals. And she hadn't changed her mind on any of them since then. <laughs> um, there's an, arg there's an argument uh, that uh, our senior military people are, are, the, are the best in the world. They're organizers, though. They're leaders. They have integrity, energy, uh, personal courage. Um, we have not been gifted uh, strategic thinkers in warfare over time. Uh, but on the other hand, our system was put together where there's two civilians who are in charge of our armed forces. They're actually in command. Uh, Tom and I were talking about the chairman of the JCS is not in command. The Joint Chiefs of Staff, the JCS 2000 officers, are advisors to political leadership. And I think that process failed us uh, badly. Um, it was a great disappointment to me. Petraeus I've known since he was 25. I told people for years, this guy's a national treasure. Uh, we got the right leadership in there, and things changed. Leadership is everything. But then the final notion, we picked this up out of Vietnam. Whatever you do in this country, you've got to go tell the American people. You have to explain it to them. Here's what we want to do. Does it make sense? The American people didn't walk away from Vietnam nor Iraq because of casualties. We had 460,000 killed in action, died of wounds, died of disease in the last 75 years. American people walk away from these wars when they conclude these people don't know what they're doing. And in both cases, that's what happened. Well, 
Let me make a bookend and, and end up where Bill started to thank the, the Chancellor and the Carnegie Corporation, in particular as President Vartan Gregorian, and especially our guests for a delightful evening. Thank you. Thank you.